60 years. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, that's how many harvests we have left. That's 60 years of food production based on our current rates of soil loss until we can no longer produce food. Soil is the source of all life on this planet, and it's disappearing at such unimaginable rates that in just a few generations, we may no longer be able to even feed ourselves. Why is that? Well, if you look at a map, you'll see that one-third of the Earth's landmass is grasslands. That's five billion hectares, or 12 and a half billion acres, of grassland, rangeland, pasture, prairie, whatever you want to call it, and underneath all of that grass is soil. Think of the Sahel in Africa, or the Mongolian steppe, La Pampas in Argentina, or the Great Plains here in the U.S. All of these expansive open spaces are key players in balancing our planetary ecosystem. When grasslands are thriving, its soils are teeming with life, and the soil acts as a sponge soaking up water to recharge underground aquifers. It's creating wildlife habitat, and every blade of grass is acting like a little solar panel, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into soil organic matter, turning sunlight into life through the magic of photosynthesis. The problem is, our grasslands aren't thriving. In fact, scientists estimate that up to 70% of them are dying and turning to desert, a process known as desertification. Now, why is that? Well, if you look back at what sustained life on this planet for millennia, you'll see that nature is complex, and Mother Nature depends on these symbiotic relationships between plants and animals. For grasslands, that symbiosis is with the ruminant, the grazing herbivore. Think of the great wildebeest migration in Africa, or the 75 million bison that used to roam across North America. These massive grazing herds would stay tightly bunched to stay safe from their predators. They would graze some grasses and trample down the rest. Their urine and dung would act as a natural fertilizer for the land. And they would move on to fresh pasture and then not return to that same piece of land until those grasses and their deep perennial roots had fully recovered. Problem is, We've domesticated most of our wild grazers, we've killed off most of their natural predators, and we've put up cities and roads and infrastructure that prevents those movements that our grasslands and grazers co-evolved with. The problem is not, as many would lead you to believe, that livestock are inherently destructive to land. Quite the opposite. Livestock are necessary for healthy grasslands, whether that be cattle, bison, goats, sheep, what have you. When a cow comes and takes a bite on a blade of grass, that encourages regrowth and growing stronger for that blade of grass. Rather, it's us, it's humans. We are the ones who have screwed everything up. We have thrown the natural order out of whack, but it doesn't have to be like that. You see, livestock are essentially a tool. Think of a hammer. A hammer isn't good or bad. You can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use a hammer to knock someone upside the head. It depends on how you use that tool. The same thing goes for livestock. You can mismanage livestock on your land and totally destroy that ecosystem. Or you can properly manage your livestock and regenerate the health of that ecosystem. To put it into simpler terms, it's not the cow, it's the how. This photo is from a large ranch in South Africa. I want you to notice the difference on both sides of the fence. On the right side, all that bare ground. On the left side, all those lush grasses. Well, on the right side, you might be thinking, well, that's, that must be overgrazed. I'm actually going to throw a new term at you. It's actually undergrazed. You see, on the right side of that fence, all animals have been removed. There is no grazing whatsoever. Mother Nature has been left alone to do her thing. And while that sounds nice in principle, and it's convenient, the reality is, is that when you divorce grassland and grazer, you have broken the natural cycle. And because of that, the land begins to die off. Now, on the left side of the fence, that's what we call holistic management. I work for a nonprofit, the Savory Institute. 
And we work with farmers and ranchers and pastoralist communities all around the world to help them with their grazing so that they can get grassland regeneration as lush as you see in the left side of that photo. Holistic management is animals being controlled in a careful and intentional manner. It's matching the number of animals to the amount of available forage. It's honoring the recovery rates of those grasses. It's creating grazing plans that are in line with the natural rhythms of the environment. And it's adapting those plans based on the changing conditions. By properly managing livestock like this, we have the potential to actually regenerate all those dying grasslands. And in the process, we can be sequestering massive amounts of CO2 out of the air and store it back underground in the soils where it belongs, all the while creating nutrient-dense food, restoring wildlife habitat, and so much more. But don't take my word for it. Researchers at Berkeley, Texas A&M, Michigan State University, and others are all studying these grazing practices, and they're finding that they do indeed regenerate grasslands and improve soil health. They're finding that when you switch to holistic management or adaptive multi-paddock grazing, as some of them refer to it in the literature, you can sequester three to eight additional tons of carbon per hectare per year. Now, why is this important? Well, if you've paid attention to the rising levels of atmospheric CO2, you know that we recently hit 415 parts per million, and that's way above pre-industrial levels of 280. Experts generally agree that we need to get back down to 350 if we're going to stabilize this mess we're in. But business as usual, if we don't change anything, it's not going to cut it. And there's a lot of excitement surrounding renewable energy. And renewable energy is great, and it's wonderful, and we need to get to net zero emissions. But we're not going to fix this with electric cars and solar panels alone, because we are already way up there. We need to take all that excess CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back underground where it belongs. So let's look at what that could look like. I had mentioned three to eight tons of carbon per hectare per year in the literature. We'll take the low end. We'll be conservative. We'll say three tons. And let's apply that to 20% of our global grasslands. So that's a billion hectares. If we can combine renewable energy, if we can decarbonize our energy system, while at the same time recarbonizing our soils, this is what atmospheric CO2 can start to look like. Now, this isn't some far out concept. This is actionable right now. It doesn't require any fancy technology, just some holistic thinking and determination. The solution is literally right beneath our feet. And there is a global movement that is growing every day of farmers, ranchers, and pastoralists that are all beginning to implement these practices. Here's one example. This is a photo I took last year in Kenya. At the Savory Institute, we work all around the world. We've got training hubs scattered about. And our local training hub in Kenya is working with the Maasai at the Inankishu Conservancy, because even they, as pastoralists, are feeling the effects of desertification. Their land is getting worse and worse as time goes on. Now, as pastoralists, everyone has livestock. So there's these small herds all scattered about. Everyone's competing for the same grass. So if I don't graze it, someone else will. I better get to it first. Now, in this situation, with everyone competing for the same grass, the land never gets a chance to take a breather never gets a chance to recover. So we've worked with the Maasai, and instead of all those small herds scattered about, they've combined their animals into one large herd, and they move them according to a communal grazing plan. And what that's done is that for the first time out on the Inankishu Conservancy, their land has had a chance to rest and recover. And because of that, the grasses are regrowing, and the streams are flowing again. And coolest of all, the African wildlife has returned. If you notice in the background of this photo, there's impala and gazelles, wildebeest, warthogs, and there's a lot more out of the frame of the photo as well. All that wildlife coming back to their lands has allowed the Maasai to additionally take part and benefit from ecotourism. They get to benefit from all the funds and prosperity that that brings back to their local tribes. 
It's really an incredible model, and for all the conservationists out there, it goes to show that wildlife and properly managed livestock can peacefully coexist. In fact, not just coexist with one another, but actually benefit from one another, because those livestock are creating the habitat for the wildlife. This is Will Harris. He's a fifth-generation farmer down in southwest Georgia. He's a good friend of mine. Years ago, he had four employees that were all making minimum wage. He managed his farm according to conventional practices, really as everyone does, and he was seeing his land declining in health, as everyone does with those conventional practices. He was getting by on razor-thin margins, which were getting thinner and thinner, and really, with nothing else to lose, he said, well, I guess I'll try this hippy-dippy holistic management thing. <laughs> that is exactly how he sounds, I swear to God. <laughs> and he's a good friend of mine, so I'm allowed to do that accent. <laughs> Today, Will's Farm, White Oak Pastures, employs 165 people that make double the county average. This in one of the poorest counties in America. His farm is so productive, both ecologically and because of that financially, that he's buying up old dilapidated buildings, turning them into a restaurant, a general store, administrative offices, employee housing. He has taken a town on the brink of collapse and turned it into a thriving ecosystem, all because of how he manages his land and his livestock together. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking, well, this all sounds nice, but we all know that cows burp methane, and methane is 25 times more damaging to the environment than CO2. Well, if you're asking that question, wonderful question. It shows that you're paying attention. It shows that you give a damn, and that's more that can be said than most. We need more people asking questions about not just what food does to their individual bodies, but what it does collectively to our environment. But secondly, those statistics that we seem to hear all day, every day, about how livestock are destroying the planet, those come from feedlots, from factory farming, the industrialization of agriculture, and they have nothing to do with what Will and the Maasai and so many others around the world are doing. Just to drive that home, I want to show you a life cycle analysis that was recently conducted at White Oak Pastures. It's conducted by a third-party firm. They came in and looked at all the greenhouse gases going into and out of the farm. They looked at things like fuel usage, transportation, slaughter, even methane. Methane is included here. That's important. But look at the soil carbon drawdown. Look at all the CO2 that they're able to suck out of the atmosphere and turn into soil organic carbon. Because of how productive they have made their land, White Oak Pastures is removing more carbon than they are emitting. They have created a net carbon sink. For every pound of beef that comes off of White Oak Pastures, they are removing three and a half pounds of CO2 out of the atmosphere into the soil because of livestock. Now, this life cycle analysis was actually conducted by the very same firm that was hired by Impossible Burger to analyze their impact. You know, Impossible Burger, it's that new uh, fake meat made from ultra-processed soy. It's starting to pop up in places like Burger King and celebrities' Instagram feeds, you know, reliable sources of information. <laughs> so, anyways, let's compare protein to protein in their net carbon footprints. So we'll start on the left side of this graph with conventional beef. Conventional beef is essentially growing grain and feeding it to cows in feedlots. They got a plus 33, which means for every pound of conventional beef that's made, 33 pounds of CO2 are released out into the atmosphere. That is not good at all. Now, we move on to pork and chicken. They're a little less. But then let's move on to the fake meats. We've got Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. They've got a plus four and a plus 3.5. Now that's better than the conventional beef for sure, but they still have a positive number. They're still doing damage to the environment because essentially what used to be grasslands have been plowed up and turned into crops. All of that bare ground between the rows of crops releases CO2 out into the atmosphere. They may have a smaller footprint than conventional beef, but this still comes from an industrial monoculture. 
It's not the factory farming of animals, but these fake meats are still the factory farming of plants, and they're still causing a problem. But look, over on the far right, Will's Beef, White Oak Pastures, holistically managed, flips the axis. Negative 3.5. Of all these proteins, it's the only one with a negative footprint. Of all these proteins, it's the only one that's creating an ecosystem rather than destroying an ecosystem. You know, we keep being told to eat less meat, that we need to get rid of all of our livestock, but when we buy into this logic, which is very convenient, we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater and we are ignoring the massive potential that lies in regenerating our global grasslands. We're missing out on opportunities like this before and after in Australia, or this one in Mexico, or this incredible regrowth in Zimbabwe. We should all be able to agree that factory farming and the industrialization of agriculture is a huge problem, both for our personal health and for our planetary health, and we need to do something about it. But the holistic management of grazing animals on our global grasslands should be welcomed with open arms by farmers, environmentalists, vegans, soccer moms, conservationists, anyone who cares about life on this planet. Regardless of what you eat, our continued existence on this planet depends on us taking care of the totality of this planet. That includes her forests, her oceans, her rivers, and yeah, even her grasslands. And those grasslands, they need to be grazed. Oh, and last thing, remember those uh, 60 years that the UN said we have left? They said that six years ago, so <laughs> clock's ticking. <laughs>